Liberal Viewer presents. So last week I got the chance to do something really cool because of my volunteer activism with the American Civil Liberties Union. That's because the ACLU of California has been running this education effort to get people to vote in elections on June 3rd for local district attorneys and sheriffs because they're really powerful elected officials. So my local ACLU chapter organized a debate between Anne-Marie Schubert and Todd Laris, two of the candidates running to replace the retiring district attorney in my county, who's in charge of prosecuting almost all violations of California law in the county. And the really cool opportunity I got was helping formulate some of the questions asked of the candidates. Now, my regular viewers know I'm kind of infamous for asking loaded questions at the end of my videos, but I don't have a problem with questions that assume facts as long as those facts are true. Even that most infamous loaded question, have you stopped beating your wife, isn't wrong to ask a man after he's convicted of domestic violence, so when I helped draft a question about my county sheriff breaking the California law against holding most undocumented immigrants for federal authorities that I discussed in one of my recent videos, there was nothing wrong with loading that fact into the first question I helped draft, as you can see here. The Trust Act was passed so people in our immigrant communities could talk to local law enforcement without fear of deportation. Yet there's some indication that Sacramento County has held undocumented immigrants in jail for federal authorities when the law says they should have been released. If you become district attorney, what will you do to make sure the Trust Act is fully implemented in Sacramento County? This is a really important issue because it comes up over and over again in all of the forums and also just meeting with people in groups and clubs and community meetings. And the answer to that is to fully enforce the law and the spirit of the law. I've seen what happens over in federal court with what's called the 1326 proceedings and deportation proceedings, and I know that there's some controversy about some of the immigration policies of the administration, of the Obama administration. My view is if we're going to encourage people to come in and report crimes like domestic violence and violent crimes, we need to be able to assure them that we're not going to be putting them in jail or that we're not going to be holding on to them just long enough so that someone from ICE can come and put a detainer on them. So that would be the simple answer to that question. Fully comply with the law and ensure that victims of crime are protected from deportation proceedings. Ms. Schubert? I think that Mr. Larris and I would probably completely agree on the issue, which is that we should fully enforce the law. Um, does the DA's office have a role on who's, who's having ice holds put on it? No. But what we do have a role in, in, in being a leader in this community, is working with our local law enforcement, the Sheriff's Department, as well as the ICE individuals that are placing these holds on them, and making sure that that's being enforced. But really, the second component of that, which I think is equally just as important, is increasing reporting from indi individuals who may well be uh, here undocumented. How do we do that as an organization? It goes back to my same philosophy of outreach. Okay. We don't. We have a U visa process that protects individuals from deportation if they're the victims or witnesses of certain types of crimes. We need to do more as a DA's office, and that is to go out to places like my sister's house or go out to La Familia so that we can educate individuals. We want you to report. We want. We know that domestic violence is underreported. We know that human trafficking is underreported. We want those reports. We want to hold those people accountable, whether it's the pimps, the human traffickers, whether it's the, the, the individuals that are committing family violence, because that's good for our community, that's good for them individually, and it's good for us as a whole. So thank you for that. It was nice to see both candidates agree on the importance of local law enforcement building trust with immigrant communities without fear of deportation, but the candidates disagreed a lot more on the second question I helped draft, this one on the big topic of incarceration versus rehabilitation, and specifically California's AB 109 realignment law that I've discussed in previous videos that's supposed to keep less serious felony offenders in county programs or county jails instead of state prisons. Now, because my county spent most of its realignment money on jails instead of rehabilitation programs, I helped load those facts into my second loaded question of the debate you can see here. The um, AB 109 realignment law encourages counties to invest in community-based alternatives to incarceration over more jail construction and custody-based solutions. Yet, according to a March 12th article by a Sacramento Bee reporter, Andy Furlow, four out of five of the dollars that are spent in realignment in the county are allocated to sheriff custody programs. As district attorney and one of the seven members of the Community Corrections Partnership Executive Committee that plans realignment spending, do you support the current allocation of realignment dollars 
How would you choose between more jails and the evidence-based rehabilitation programs that help people and improve our community? Uh, great question, Mr. White. Um, let me kind of give you a, my concept of realignment, which, and I've made this comment publicly, was is that I believe that there's very noble goals to realignment, and those evidence-based programs are critically important to get to what those goals are. However, it is without a doubt the most grossly underfunded uh, effort that was basically placed upon us by the state. To give an example, the Department of Corrections budget prior to AB 109 for corrections was $13 billion. Since AB 109 uh, came in, the Department of Corrections budget has gone down to $9 billion. So they reduced the state budget by $4 billion. There has only been $1 billion given to the state, to the counties, for the full enforcement of AB 109. And so with that, as the next district attorney, you have to make decisions on, on how are we going to balance the needs of public safety. We have individuals that are in our jail that, quite frankly, are not low-level offenders, but they are defined, quote-unquote, because the legislature says that. For instance, we have an individual that may well be there that has two kilos of cocaine armed with a machine gun that they've defined as being low-level and is now going to be housed locally. So we have to balance those needs. Will I work together with corrections, uh, community corrections partnership? Absolutely. But I think a lot of it also has to be with following the, the recommendation of the Stanford study, which just came out in November, which is cap those jail sentences at three years, look at the person's past criminal history when they're deciding that they really are low level. And if we can look at those and reduce those numbers in our county jail facilities, we're going to free up the money to get to those noble goals, which I do believe in, and I believe is critically important to get to those rehabilitation services. So thank you for that. Mr. Larris? I fully support realignment, and I think that what should happen with realignment in the next few years under the next administration is that it should move slowly away from the idea of funding the jail and improvements in the jail. And those are needed, quite frankly, in order to house people who used to go to state prison but are now being housed there, and more towards what you just talked about in association with partnerships. Uh, coming up with evidence-based programs that are designed, as I said, to get at the root causes of, of crime. Whether they be beefing up drug courts, beefing up alternative courts like veterans treatment courts, or trying alternative methods of uh, probation that reward good behavior instead of simply punishing bad behavior. By that I mean doing things like reducing time, suspended time, or the term of probation for doing things like getting a job, completing an educational program, completing a job training program the types of things we want to see offenders doing. But let me say this, I have said I embrace realignment and I will continue to say that. And the reason is, it makes DAs do what they constantly ask defendants to do in closing arguments. That is, we're here about making you responsible for your choices. Now, what I'm talking about there is this, we've allowed district attorneys throughout the state to politicize crime by saying, I'm making you safer by taking offenders and then making them the state's problem. And they could do that across the board when there was plenty of bed space. If you think about it, they could say, we're going to take drug offenders. We're going to take people who have violated on parole. We're going to give them priority for those beds and those spaces. At the same time, what were we doing? We're incarcerating more people for longer periods of time under three strikes and under our uh, sentencing laws regarding homicide. Well, now the DA has to be responsible for saying, I want the worst offenders to be the ones who get the bed space. And the only way to do that is to make sure that we keep empty bed space locally and have beefed up realignment treatment programs. So I fully support that concept. One minute of rebuttal, Ms. Schubert. Yes, I'm going to give you a couple of examples why I don't support uh, realignment fully or fully embrace it, contrary to Mr. Lehrer's. One, under California's realignment law, Penal Code Section 181, which is slavery, is considered a low-level offense. If you have two kilos of cocaine armed with a machine gun, it is considered a low-level offense under California law. That same offense under federal law can get you 40 years in federal prison. So supplying methamphetamine with armed with a machine gun is considered low-level in Sacramento, or in California, I should say. But if you illegally sell horse meat in the state of California, you're considered a violent offender who should now go to straight prison, state, uh, correct, uh, straight to prison. Um, do I disagree with that? I think, yes, those are the types of things. I do not believe that paroled sex offenders should be supervised locally. We, on a local level, see them housed, uh, or I should say, are constantly ripping off their ankle bracelets. I consider that dangerous for the public, and I think it's dangerous as a parent and as well as a prosecutor. I agree with Mr. Larris. We need to save the bed space for the violent offenders, but there are certain ones that need to go to prison, and we need to redefine what the legislature has done. Thank you. 
So what do you think? Was it fair to ask the candidates those loaded questions given that the questions were loaded with accurate facts? And about the responses, did you prefer the answers of Anne-Marie Schubert or Todd Laris? I YouTube, you decide.